Hello and welcome to Solutions for Your Life, the University of Florida St. Lucie County Extension Program. And today I am welcoming Kate Ritindo. Kate is our urban horticulture educator for the county. And Kate, welcome. Thank you very much, Ed. So to, to start with, well, first of all, October is one of my favorite times of the year. Me too. I, people have, you know, they like Easter or they'll like Christmas, but I like October because you can start planting yeah. your garden yeah. and your vegetable <laughs> garden specifically. So I, I, I would like to talk about that today, but before that, let's go ahead and kind of explain what you do as an urban horticulture educator for the University of Florida. Sure. So uh, I came to Extension about three, almost three years ago, believe it or not. It's two and a half years this summer. Uh, as the urban horticulture agent and so we do educational programs for the public and my arena really is well urban horticulture and what falls under that is vegetable gardening so I'm really excited to to talk to you about that today well good so you'll also you're in, uh, in charge of the master gardener program and talk a little bit about that for us please. sure absolutely so we have a wonderful master gardener volunteer program that myself and my program assistant Kate O'Neill uh, deal with and teach and manage and coordinate. Um, we have a lot of volunteers that get trained. Uh, we have over 80 active volunteers in our program, but every year we have a Master Gardener training program that starts in January. So if you're interested in that, it's a 12-week program, so it's like a little mini horticulture degree, and then we send you off and you are volunteers in our community and sort of a, an extension of me as the agent. So get in touch with us if, if folks are interested in uh, joining our Master Gardener program. It's a really neat program that we have in, in St. Lucie County. All right, so, and as I said today, we would like to talk about backyard vegetable gardening. And in a number of, of our homes and homeowners and, uh, situations and backyards, we don't have a whole lot of space to be able to put a vegetable garden in. And the other thing is we don't have a lot of time mm. uh, to be able to properly, to properly take care of that, of that garden. So let's start a little bit, uh, let's start by, you know, first of all, looking at, you know, first thing we need to do is we need to get some seeds either in the ground or in uh, the, uh, the box that you want to garden in or, you know, putting them in a little starting kit. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Go ahead and if we could and talk a little bit about that, how we select those seeds, and how we plant them. And Absolutely, so kind of from the beginning, because yeah. you know, like you said, um, that's one of my favorite things to teach and talk about and do is vegetable gardening. I have a background in uh, vegetable research, and so it's always been sort of a passion of mine, and uh, I know you and I spend a lot of time in the hallway talking about our vegetable gardens, and um, fall is definitely my, my favorite time of year, like you said, October because uh, we get to start things. So um, one of the things that we like to teach homeowners about especially is that site selection, where you're going to have your garden before you even think about what you're going to grow, really where are you going to do this. And like you mentioned, um, whether you're going to do it in the ground, uh, whether you're going to be planting in a box or containers. Um, one of the best things we can help homeowners do is really figure out that timing and what kind of, of of selections of varieties that you're going to be um, gardening with. So I like to start with seeds and that's one of the things that you know you and I talk about a lot is the different varieties that you can get through um, seed catalogs that uh, oftentimes have really good viability when you're when you're purchasing from a, a reputable source uh, which we can always help with out at Extension if you have any questions where to get seeds uh, but starting with good healthy seeds that's really going to be your you know first step to success, but really talking about um, what types of varieties and really encouraging folks to look for varieties that do well here and that are proven to be, you know, good um, good producers here. There are some varieties that don't maybe do as well here. So, sure. yeah, looking through your seed catalogs or even, you know, getting in touch with us at Extension, um, some of those varieties that are resistant to some of the pests or diseases that we have. Uh, but starting out with good seeds is always a good idea. Yeah. So, and is there any one soil or substrate, as others call it, right. that is 
better to start your seeds with than than others? Yeah, there are seed starter mixes that do that are commercially available that we really recommend using uh, because they're a really nice blend of things. You don't want seeds to really sit in in mucky substrate. They don't really do well when they're planted too deep. Uh, so that from the very beginning, you know, kind of babying those seeds and using that the best seed starter mix is going to, you know, kind of springboard you to success, I think. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I like playing golf. Mm -hmm. And of course, <laughs> part of that is you have these little golf mm -hmm. tees. And if you just measure the right amount yeah. on that pointed yeah. end of the golf tee, you can go ahead and just poke a hole, put yeah. a seed, poke a hole, put a seed. Yeah. So and kind of methodical work where you get to poke those little seeds, about an eighth of an inch, quarter of an inch, depending on the size of the seed. Mm -hmm. Uh, but a golf tee works great. I have a little, you know, of course, it's uh, a specialized seed tool. I lose it every year in the garden somewhere. So I yeah. end up using a stick or a pencil. Sure. But measuring that, you know, quarter inch, uh, eighth of an inch to make sure you're not planting too deep and not too close to the surface either. And on the back of your seed packet, mm -hmm. it'll tell you that, right? Yeah, okay. it should tell you a lot of things on the back of a seed packet, which is really, um, I'm, not a great shopper, but I do love to shop for seeds. And so it will tell you on the back of a seed packet uh, when the best time to plant is uh, in general. Uh, but then it also tells you, you know, about harvest times, uh, you know, when what kind of um, planting depth it should go to. Uh, but the, the timing of these of planting is really important. That's one of the things that we like to give to um, or share with the public is we have a great document. University of Florida has a vegetable gardening guide. Uh, that's online that's a great resource to show you what crops do really well in fall or in uh, warm season or cool season crops and so I think with beginner gardeners oftentimes uh, the ones that I've run into that maybe are frustrated they're planting things at the wrong time and so the timing of things can be really important in even a backyard garden well okay so and on some of these seeds some of them are coated mm -hmm and others aren't. Yep. So is, is there an advantage to a coated seed as opposed to a, to a non-coated, other than the fact that you can, you can like, see the seed? Right, <laughs> sometimes that, you know, there are certain uh, uh, plant species that produce very tiny little seeds. Carrots, lettuce are really small. Um, so sometimes with that, that uh, superficial coating, uh, they do certain things. They can protect the seed a little bit, uh, but it sort of depends on, on um, on what your preference is, uh, but you're you're right. With some of those smaller seeds, it is a little bit easier to have things coated. But make sure uh, that when you're dealing with seeds, you know if they're coated with any sort of fungicide. Make sure you're wearing gloves and properly handling sure. those. Um, if they have any color on them, obviously they've probably been treated. But you can kind of go either way. Some of those they do get a little better jump start because if they start with a little bit of um, of help from the beginning, it can help with that with that seed germination. Some of the seeds are just so tiny mm -hmm. that you just can't help but yeah. get two or three of them in your planting. Oh, hole. yeah. So is that a concern? You just kind of let not, that go? Yeah, and... not to me. I, you know, personally, as a vegetable gardener, I probably overseed a lot of times in my little trays. But what you can do is really cull out the one that is, is strong, is the, the tallest one or the most robust looking little seedling. Let that get fairly large, depending on the, the plant species. But those other tiny ones, you can either, you know, kind of cull them out and throw them in the compost. Uh, but yeah, taking that, that strongest little seedling is probably going to be the best one. So like you say, when you call, you just kind of snip it out with a yeah. scissors or Scissors you know, or, you know, like some of them, you know, yeah, it's best to kind of clip them out or gently pull them out because you don't really want to disrupt that root system right. of the seed seedling because they're very delicate at this stage. Yeah. Well, so you, you've got your seed planted and it's, it's in the soil or substrate mm -hmm. that you have chosen. Uh, and in terms of keeping that soil wet, is there mm -hmm. any one way that's better than, than another, or what would you recommend there? Yeah, I mean, there's so many different options for homeowners, whether it's, you know, just using the hose or a watering can. Uh, there's all kinds of different irrigation options as far as micro-irrigation, and I, I think that irrigation is becoming a little bit more, e a little easier for homeowners nowadays. You don't have to buy, you know, in bulk a gross of, of uh, a thousand microjets. You can go to some of our local um, irrigation companies and they can help you figure out how to do either drip line or drip tape, um, some soaker hoses. So in a nutshell, there's a ton of different ways to do irrigation. I think for homeowners, really the consistency of how you're irrigating is probably more important than maybe the specifics of how you're doing it, but making sure that, um, you know, letting that top few 
you know, inch or so layer, it can actually dry out uh, so that you're not overwatering, but making sure you're getting that nice deep watering for those plants as they become bigger. Because we've talked about, um, you and I in the hallway, about how much, you know, our, our seedlings, our tomatoes especially at the beginning don't take much water, but as they grow, we've got to make sure as gardeners we keep up with that because they can drink a lot of water by the end of the season. Sure. Let's, I want to back up just sure. a little bit sure. and talk about the the seedling trays mm -hmm. or the planting trays. There's a number of different types and and so is there, there one that's any better? Is there anything that you can use you know, from the house to, to go ahead and, and use as a yeah. planting tray? Yeah, kind there's of a, lots of, you know, kind of like irrigation is sort of an endless um, uh, option for homeowners uh, because especially our gardens aren't normally as big as a farm. So we can kind of keep things a little bit on a smaller scale. There's styrofoam trays, there's um, uh, plastic trays that have little um, cells, what they call them, where they have little seedling trays. Uh, there's compostable uh, peat moss kind of uh, or newspaper that's squished together and made mm -hmm. to be little um, seedling trays. You can use yogurt cups. Um, I've used egg, tr egg cartons, uh, poking a little hole inside of each one of those. Uh, the styrofoam ones work great. Um, and styrofoam for the egg cartons, those are great because you can wash them out and use them again. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so we've gotten to the point, we've got our seeds sure. in, everything's going good, mm -hmm. and, and our vegetable or lettuce or whatever starts popping up in it. So at what stage do you want to transplant from your seedling tray over to your garden? Sure, that's a good question because there are some species that really, they don't like to be moved too much. Uh, radishes, carrots, things like that. They really, once you plant them, you really need to stick them where they're going. But other things like lettuce, uh, tomatoes, peppers, they transplant fairly easily. Uh, I usually like to get mine about three, four inches tall so that they have a, a good root system. Uh, but you're, if you're planting in those little seedling trays or even your egg carton trays, making sure you use a scoop um, or some sort of uh, stick or maneuver to kind of get all most of that root system out that you can and lift out uh, all of that so you're not disrupting it too much. Yeah. Yeah, that's really important. We, yeah. We try to, like, maybe a little spatula or yeah. something like yeah. that. Or, you know, we use as a as an old cheese cutter. Yeah, and yeah. Something like that so that you can, you can get under. Underneath there, I've used a, a, an old grapefruit spoon before. Those sure. work great because they're sort of flat, but they have a little point on the end, mm -hmm. sort of. Uh, but kind of, you know, gently scooping out. The worst thing that we can do as, as gardeners is kind of pull out by the stem because I've done that before yeah. in a hurry and I think, oh, I can get it. And then you end up uh, destroying the root system. So we've talked a little bit about a uh, plant and uh, garden site selection. Mm -hmm. Uh, and can we just kind of go in that a little bit more, sure. please? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's important to do that. You know, I, I get excited about, like I said, with, with seed shopping or going to the garden center and looking at their transplants, but really knowing where you're going to put your vegetable garden is a, um, kind of the first step. It's not as exciting as, as knowing what you're going to plant, but getting that between five to seven hours of really direct sunlight, six to seven is really best. Um, you know, we, we don't get that all the time. My neighbor's oak tree is starting to encroach a little bit yeah. on my garden. Uh, but, you know, that five to seven hour range of direct sunlight is really good. Also, um, having good drainage, whether you are actually planting in the ground or in your containers, that has a lot to do with, with that soil mix that you're using um, to make sure that things aren't staying really mucky. So that site selection is really, it is actually important to kind of back up and be the first step. Sure. If you're a beginning vegetable mm -hmm. gardener and you're, you're just starting out, what sorts of varieties of vegetable do you recommend? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you want success. Yeah. And yeah. success will kind of keep you motivated yeah. and, and, and get you going along a little bit further. So Yeah. Is, yeah, you don't want to start out, you know, uh, already defeated or frustrated. That's, no. you know, it's, it's you know, I, I think whether you've gardened two seasons or 200, I think you're going to learn something every season. Uh, you know, oh, that didn't work or that variety didn't perform as well. But um, there's several, you know, cherry tomatoes that do very well in our, our region, um, any lettuce varieties, some peppers. So really starting with that, herbs are a great way to start for, you know, beginner gardeners. Um, something that is, is pretty straightforward. There's lots of varieties that are proven to do really well here from the research. Uh, there's a lot of heirloom varieties that do well. So, yeah, I like to kind of steer, and, and oftentimes people like to eat things, you know, zucchini, tomatoes, uh, you know, planting some herbs to go with that so that you can make your own pizza. 
Uh, but oftentimes, sure. you know, planting what you're going to eat. You know, if your family doesn't really like lettuce, then maybe not, not you know, steer that way and, and go toward ve a vegetable that they like to eat. Well, it's interesting when you ta start talking about varieties mm -hmm. and, and growing in Florida, mm -hmm. a lot different than if you're growing up in up in the north. Of course, yeah. first of all, you're your planting seasons totally com different. completely <laughs> turned around, <laughs> totally so you're starting different. to plant in October. Yeah. But again, when you look at some of your seeds mm -hmm. and you're looking through your catalog, they'll talk about uh, heat resistant mm -hmm. and slow bolting uh, varieties of vegetables. Can you talk about that yeah, a little bit absolutely. for me, please? So within, you know, really any uh, quality um, uh, seed catalog or any seed catalog, or excuse me, seed uh, packet that you get at a garden center or whether you're ordering, the, ordering them online, it really should tell you if we do have a lot of pests here in our soils in Florida um, and we have some v resistant varieties to nematode, um, to certain fungal diseases that we have, verticillium, um, that just exist in our soils. And so looking at your seed packet and making sure that you're looking at some of those varieties that may be resistant um, to those pests. And also, like you said, because we have some different growing conditions here um, in South Central Florida, you wanna make sure that you get uh, varieties like of lettuce that are slow to bolt because sometimes in those fall seasons, we're staying pretty hot throughout yes. the season. Um, even though lettuce likes it a little bit cooler, uh, we do um, have some great varieties that are slow to bolt, so they'll kind of stay more compact instead of going straight to seed. Then it, then that lettuce becomes a little bit bitter and not quite as enjoyable from the garden. Sure, and you know, we're, we're vegetable gardeners. Mm -hmm. We've been doing it for a while, so yeah. we understand what the term bolting means. Yes. But can we kind of just sure. back up a little and sure. explain that, please? Absolutely, yeah. so that bolting term is really when a, a species like lettuce decides, you know what? It's hot enough, and I've needed to decide that my my vegetative, the part that we like to eat, that vegetative growth, we're done with that, and we're going to go ahead and shoot up and make seeds. And so what will happen is it shoots up and starts to make flowers, where that vegetable or vegetative uh, growth on the bottom end, where we like to eat, like the lettuce leaves, that starts to become more um, uh, bitter, and that you know you can still eat it, but it's not quite as enjoyable. But things start to go to to flower, and then eventually go to seed, and so that's what we really mean by by bolting. Okay, so we've. What are some of the different types of vegetable gardens that we can utilize? Mm -hmm. Uh, again, in a small amount of space. Mm -hmm. I know there's square foot gardening, sure, and we have buckets that we can grow in, but. Let's kind of, what I would like to do is to be able to discuss some of the ways that it's just a little bit easier for the homeowner mm -hmm. to, to plant a garden and to maintain a garden. So what are some of those systems? Yeah, so some of the systems that we have, like you mentioned, I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those things, it's Pandora's box. Once you open up container gardening on, on Google or even UFI, yeah. this, there's a ton of options, which I think is really cool because you know, folks that live in condominiums or apartments, maybe they're not able to really dig up the earth and really, you know, have a have a square foot garden or a raised bed. Um, but there's lots of different options for folks with uh, mobility issues. We can build up raised gardens to get underneath where they can be seeded. Uh, there's hydroponic um, uh, growing systems that use coconut core that are more of vertical gardening, which is really easy for, you know, folks with mobility issues or or back issues that maybe don't really want to be lower to the to the ground. Um, there's things uh, like bucket gardening and earth boxes, which is a commercial name for a, a self-watering container. Um, so really, the possibilities are endless. There's pallet gardening. I think really, you know, the the um, the good drainage and that site selection, wherever you put things, and that that mix that you're using, whatever container you're in, really, um, it it doesn't matter necessarily, uh, you know, how it looks or uh, just as long as it's functioning the way that it really needs to. There's so many different options. Yeah. All right. So if I'm just starting out, I'm watching this show and yeah. I'm. You're talking and telling me how to how to grow vegetables. I'm getting all excited. Mm -hmm. And so, is, is there any one system that you can recommend to the beginner to kind of help them along and and get them to be more successful mm. as as a vegetable grower than another? Yeah, and I, you know, like I said, there's lots of different options, but I've brought one today that I'm going to show you. Oh, good. Um, yeah. How about that? <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, it's definitely, you know, there's, like I said, there's lots of options. Uh, maybe this might be the best one for you. 
uh, if you're in a small area, I don't know if you can see this one, but we've got um, just a five gallon bucket. Uh -huh. And this is something that we do a class in uh, that you and I have taught several times before our program Sip and Sew, uh, where we've gone to um, some local breweries and we're gonna do some this coming fall. So people need to look out for some of the dates that we put out on our website and just stay connected with us when we're gonna uh, put these classes out. But this is a, a container that we build out of a five gallon bucket. Uh, it's really um, sort of the same concept as some of the other commercially available ones that you can get. But I'll just show you real quick kind of the inside of it. Um, we won't go through the whole class because we want you to come to our classes. That's right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but this we build together at the Sip and Sew program. And this is just where you're going to be um, building a substrate kind of uh, uh, bucket, actually, that you're going to be using. Uh, where if you look down here, I'm going to show you real quick. Where you're going to just create sort of a reservoir where your water is going to be. Um, we'll teach you how to do all this and what measurements and what supplies you need. And then you're going to put your sub, your growing substrate into here and end up having this self-watering container uh, that you can basically put a hose in maybe once, twice a week. All right. um, and this is really something kind of fun for folks because you can move it. It's easy to build. Uh, I've had you know, a lot of folks tell me this is really, this is the way I jump-started my garden. I was able to do these small containers with my family, build two, three, four of them, grow some lettuce or a tomato, um, and then have some success, and then may, maybe move on to a raised bed or a square foot garden. Sure, uh, and again, we have that information at mm -hmm. our website, exactly Absolutely. how to construct and build that, yeah. and we also have our, uh, like you said, Sip and yeah. Sew, yeah. which is a great, uh, program a lot of folks have uh, attended yeah that we do with one of our local breweries yeah and we're looking to do uh, another one in Port St. Lucie yeah uh, so and then also with that with that bucket if a storm is coming mm -hmm. up or if some bad weather is yeah. coming up or if you don't get that six hours right. of sun that right. you really need right. you can kind <laughs> move of it. move it yeah very easily yeah and you know it's a good it's a good way to start. You can grow herbs in that. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's how I started. Yeah. Was just with one of those little buckets. I built one and put some herbs in it. And my wife used it for cooking. And yeah. it's a lot healthier for yeah. you than yeah. putting salt mm -hmm. and, and things yeah, like that. Yeah, you get that flavor from yeah. your herbs. And like you said, I think herbs is a great way to start. If people are really new to the area, maybe they've you know come from a different region in the U.S. where their growing seasons are totally different mm -hmm. than ours. Herbs are a really... A good way to get your foot in the door, I think. And even if it gets into the, the hotter time mm -hmm. of the year, mm -hmm. okay, into June or July, yeah. you can still grow those those herbs and, and use, absolutely. Them, use them to, to cook with. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the, you know, plant species that we can kind of tenderly walk through the summer sure. a little bit and give it a little bit of that filtered sunlight because we all know how intense June, July, August can be uh, with our, our, um, our heat and our humidity and sunlight. But Herbs are a great way to kind of get through the summer and then start start your fall gardening. Yeah. We've talked about seeding and, you know, there's some, again, convenience where mm -hmm. you can go to one of the, the stores, large stores, mm -hmm. and you can purchase uh, seedlings mm -hmm. instead of going direct seed. Right. So let's talk a little bit about that. What do you want to look for when you're purchasing a seedling and, and yeah. then also transplanting that one? Yeah, that's a really important thing because, you know, like we talked about before, seeds are, you know, they are a little bit more maintenance. That's something that you kind of have to, to walk, you know, uh, through and, and make sure you're maintaining the moisture and make sure you didn't plant it too deep. But transplant, somebody's already done that work for you in a nursery uh, somewhere far away. <laughs> They've already done that work yeah. for you. Um, but, uh, you know, some of our local garden centers, what you want to be looking for is really that healthiest transplant. You really want to look for um, a transplant that is free of disease. So no um, abnormal growth or any darkening at the bottom of the, uh, the stem. Uh, sometimes seedlings can be um, susceptible to some diseases that are in the soil. And so we want to make sure you're just looking for the healthiest um, transplant, one that's not too leggy, a term that we use that where it's kind of gotten a little too tall and it's been reaching for the light and doesn't sure. have a good robust system to it. Yeah. And so then, you know, we've got our, we've got our garden planted and did our seedlings or our seeds and mm -hmm. everything's growing really well. And, 
and we're really pleased with ourselves. But you know what, what comes along, don't you? Mm -hmm. Little insect, yeah. you must do a little chewing yep. on the side of that, and, <laughs> yeah. or a disease or something mm -hmm. like that. So, as as a gardener to to maintain that mm. that area, we always talk about integrated pest management. Yeah. And so, what are what are some of the the tips that you can provide the homeowner when it comes to to you know going out and scouting your yeah. garden and knowing what you're looking at because some insects are good right. others aren't so good right so. right and that's one of the things that you know we get a lot of questions about at, at the extension office because like you said everything's going great things look good and it feels like almost overnight something can look terrible and you think what happened um, we do have a lot of pests here but we also have a lot of beneficial uh, insects and microbial activity so it's not all bad <laughs> uh, but knowing the difference between things is really important and so like you said scouting is one of those things that I always like to teach homeowners go out in your garden every day even when things look great go out and have you know a, a cup of coffee or a glass of wine and and be proud of yourself and then when things go wrong take that cup of coffee or glass of wine out there still and really look and and turn leaves over and see if you can see the culprit that's doing some of the chewing uh, the other part that we like to talk about is that integrated pest management and really encouraging some of the good guys, some of those beneficial insects uh, by having some flowering plants, some flowering um, trees or shrubs or, or annuals even or perennials within kind of mixed in or around your garden or in your landscape because that's really going to going to encourage some of those beneficial insects and keep some of the balance of, of some of the pests that we have. I think it's also important that if you're planting, for instance, tomatoes, mm -hmm. to know what insect likes to chew on right. those tomatoes. Tomato hornworm right. is one of them. Yeah. And, and what does that look like before you might even see it? Right. Because a lot of the times with some of these pests, mm. you all of a sudden the damage shows up and you're like, well, where who is, is it? it? What yeah. is that or who is it? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so if you know, you know what you're up against, that right. identification is really important right. when, you, when you're trying to do this integrated pest management. Right, and I think like what you're, you know, um, uh, sort of talking about is that positive identification, making sure that you know um, which insects you're, you know, are doing the damage and which ones are possibly helping you out by controlling some of those pests. But yeah, like you mentioned, sometimes you don't even see the culprit doing, who's doing the damage. You might see the damage or some of the waste or excrement that they've left behind. Yes. Um, that's oftentimes what I've seen in my garden. You don't see who's doing it, but you might see the, the result of what happened. Right. So there's, you know, you, you have some symptoms and, mm -hmm. and, you know, that you look at that and say, okay, well, now let me look for right. that insect. Right. Right. How much longer can we talk about this? And probably <sighs> two or three days, but we're down, yeah. really down to our <laughs> to our last couple of minutes, okay. Kate. And so, what I would like you to do is is talk about some of the programming that yeah. you have coming up in the future, and and how we can get a hold of you out at our offices. Absolutely, I think that's one of the exciting parts that I found working through extension or in extension as an agent uh, is being able to share this information with homeowners, especially, and get excited, get them excited about vegetable gardening. So. Like I mentioned with the bucket that we showed, um, we're going to do some sip and sew programs this coming fall with some of our local breweries uh, in Fort Pierce and in Port St. Lucie. So stay in touch with us through social media. Uh, the St. Lucie County uh, Master Gardener Volunteer and uh, St. Lucie County Urban Horticulture, we both have Facebook pages. Check with our website at St. Lucie County Extension. Um, but we should be having those in the fall, so those dates haven't been quite set yet. But we also have a Sprouting Healthy Businesses class that uh, our community uh, resource development agent and I are teaching. So that's something that we are going to teach. I'll teach the horticulture vegetable gardening side of. Uh, so stay in touch with us, especially on our website and social media to keep in touch what's going on in the fall. Great. Kate, thank you for coming on thank the show so today. Thank you so much, And I appreciate all your knowledge. Absolutely. Thank Thanks. You.